but as, but as I said, and as we've been discussing, I mean, on the one hand, it is illusionistically um, exceptional, but on the other hand, it's it's actually um, incredibly sort of symbolic. Um, so it's not it's not it's you know it's it's not just what you see; it's, it's sort of what you see combined with what that all means, and, and it's it still has a lot of mystery about it for that reason. The following is a conversation with Christopher Marshall. Christopher is Associate Professor in Art History and Museum Studies at the University of Melbourne. Amongst a variety of research distinctions, Christopher was a recipient of the Paul Mellon Visiting Senior Fellowship, as well as a Senior Research Fellowship from the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. His publications include Prices, Payments and Career Strategies, Economic Considerations in the Work of Hiberta and His Contemporaries, as well as Baroque, Naples and the Industry of Painting, the world and the workbench, amongst others. On the podcast, we discuss the significance of three artists in particular, Artemisia Gentileschi, Diego Velazquez, and Michelangelo Buonarroti. In particular, we have a detailed look at the meaning of Velazquez's Las Meninas and Michelangelo's David. Both of these works of art are considered by many artists and art historians uh, to be the best that painting and sculpture have to offer. If you like this conversation, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, follow on Spotify, or follow me on Instagram at Recorded Time Podcast. I hope you enjoy the episode. Few and far between. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, sort of. You know, on the on your hand, the the your fingers. Um, up until her, her, there was hardly any female artists prior to her. Yeah, relatively yeah. speaking. Yeah, yeah. Who, who were successful and well known. Do you want to? Um, I just sort of come into this keep thing, the, rolling. Keep the, yeah, yeah, keep it about a fist away from your. Yep. Face and, Is that all right? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I go. Do with I them. need to wear the? You don't have to if you don't no. want to. I just all go right. with them because it gives me a bit more. Yeah, sure, of course. I can hear the uh, conversation a bit. Sure, of um, course. Clearer. But yeah, so go on. So Artemisia Gentileschi was seen as more of an oddity than taken seriously as an artist in her time. Do you? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, I think. Um, so, you know, one of the things you had to get over was, um, you know, the the idea that. Um, that she may be taken, she, she she may be of interest, but but she wasn't necessarily an artist that you'd come to consider you'd consider seriously as an artist, and would commission her to do the kinds of things that you would expect a serious serious artist to do. So, for instance, she had a real problem attracting uh, ecclesiastical patronage, which which which. You know, if you're an artist in that period, you need it. Um, so um, it really wasn't actually until she was like almost the latter period of her life that she got big um, church commissions that were really important. I mean, they were important not only for making money, but also for, um, but also for establishing your reputation because you know there weren't there weren't museums uh, in those or days or commercial galleries or yeah, anything like so, that yeah mm. so 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 people would really general public would would go to you know a church to see to see someone's work to understand um, you know what was significant about an artist so if you didn't have church commissions of one sort or another you kind of didn't have a profile mm. aside from breaking down the door for female artists what do you think Gentileschi Brought to the Western canon of art, stylistically. Uh, what well, lots expressed? of things. I mean, one. I mean, among other things, um, you know, I don't think Frida Kahlo or Sydney Sherman, in a way, would be possible without her. She's one of the first to um, work on her her image and her identity as part of what it was that she was kind of trading in and selling. Um, 
I mean, you know, in the process you did these, you know, wonderful kind of in, um, interpretations, creative sort of um, sleight of hand about about her own identity, you know, hidden or not hidden in paintings um, that really, you know, no female artists, in fact, hardly any male artists really up until that period, um, sort of play acting and things like that. Rembrandt was, would do it, but, you know, he became a bit more famous for it because he was a man. But she, she, she was actually doing it before him and, um, as I say, that became... Pretty foundational, I would say, for definitely for Sydney Sherman. And she was just one of the first that sort of role playing thing back in the 17th century. Yeah. Do you think Gentileschi made the female experience her subject in the same way Freda Kahlo or Paula Rago does? That's a big question. I mean, yes, but um, um, to what degree was it possible for female a, fem- a female artist at that period to foreground the female experience as the thing that you're going to communicate to your audience? Um, it wasn't possible to the same degree, obviously, as it would for an artist like Paula Rego or someone like that in the, in the in the modern period. So. She was really, really concerned with those experiences, but she had to express them through the veil, as it were, of, I guess, more conventional Baroque, um, you know, subject matter. She was forced to operate much as a male artist would in her time. Yeah, very, yeah, very much so. But, but she, but she, um, I mean, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use the word subvert because that, you know, it suggests a sort of more more modern sort of working against the grain in a sort of self consciously trying to subvert things kind of a way. But 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 she really did. She really was working against the grain in in the sense of trying to find um, a space that worked for her in a system that basically wasn't set up for her and and you know female artists and and and, and was essentially kind of. Bemused at best and probably hostile, you know, most of the other times. Mm. Getting to the painting I really wanted to talk uh, with you about, and it's a painting that has uh, obsessed me for a long time and is, I think, the best painting ever painted, uh, even though it's sometimes bad to speak in absolutes uh, in art. But talking about Velazquez's Las Meninas, could you describe uh, Velazquez's career and the cultural context within which he painted and within which that painting uh, was uh, completed? Well, um, I mean, obviously, it's it's kind of a summation in a way of a of a of a of, of quite a long career he's already had before. Then he's started off in Seville. Um, you know, he's long past being a young. Uh, Turk, he's he's at a, he's shown this incredible um, technical um, facility and bravura, which ultimately gets him he gets out of Seville, um, and of course moves to Madrid and um, attracts the attention of the court in in Madrid. Every in Spain at that period being um, a um, uh, absolute monarchy, it, more even, you know, you'd say it even more strongly than that. I mean, they they kind of worshipped the um, the monarchy, the king and the queen, and the royal family were were kind of um, like celestial or saintly um, figures, um, much much higher than, in a way, mere the mere mortal people of the court that surrounded them, and that's extremely important for Las Meninas that he paints after years and years of working at the Spanish court, and he ultimately becomes. Um, the uh, like the court painter Maggiordomo, he, he kind of arranges the um, um, he arrange, almost almost like a curator, I guess you'd say, for the king um, uh, and the royal family, and he's um, you know buying paintings for them and advising them on artistic matters and um, becoming an inseparable part of their 
of, of the of the household. Um, the story is, and so he's given a he's given a, um, a, a you know an, a, a room of his own in in the royal palace of Alcazar in Madrid. And um, the story is that. King um, Philip IV actually, you know, comes and visits him and, and sits down and watches him painting, which is again, you know, a, a very unusual because you know he's a, he's a mere, um, he, he, you know, he's a, he's not a um, he's an artisan rather than exactly, an artist. Yep. exactly. Yep. Uh, but 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 the king is just so um, close to him, relatively in relative terms, and and so a, a, you know, um, a, such a. Uh, um, uh, uh, attracted to what he does, that 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 they they have this kind of amazing relationship, even though they are from completely different worlds, and he's kind of exploring that um, along with really exploring the whole idea of different levels of reality, um, uh, and also the potentiality of painting to render forth presence. Uh, in a way that that makes it so vivid that you feel that um, it's kind of happening before your eyes. All of those things he's kind of um, thinking about, and as he's painting this this huge painting, which is a, a sort of a reflection on the art of painting itself, um, using the idea of a of a sitting for a portrait um, as as a sort of a, I guess a sort of a framework or something for him to have this almost um, philosophical kind of um, thoughts about about the nature of, um, as I say, perception and rendering forth um, pres- objects with this incredible kind of presence to them. Um, it, it, it kind of makes it, it, in a way it makes more sense when you see the original because it it's a very large painting so the figures do almost come to life and kind of, you know, um, talk to you, as it were. Mm-hmm. Maybe as well, just moving forward with the podcast, it'd be best if we describe the painting as well because this is just uh, audio. There's no video, obviously. Um, so we've got the Princess Margarita in the middle uh, being attended to by uh, two maids of honour. We've got uh, a dwarf on the right, a boy kicking uh, a dog on the ground, we have Velazquez on the left... Uh, looking out at us with a paintbrush and then at the back we have a mirror reflecting the uh, king and queen, uh, King Philip IV. So how do you interpret this painting? What do you think it's about? Um, yeah, well, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people have uh, thought about that for a long time. Um, well, okay, on a simple level, I mean, it shows the we see the back of the painting. He sees... The painting that he's painting, and we kind of assume maybe that the painting that he's painting is the painting that we see. Maybe, maybe that's it. Um, so, as I said, in a you know, in a simple level, although nothing about it really is simple, it's a painting about painting. Um, it's a painting about he is painting um, the Infanta, the, the the daughter of the king and, and king and queen of Spain. Um, and he and he's he's trying to show you the process. He's trying to show you, um, you know, backstage, as it were, you know, in in a, in in the theatrical production of a painting. He's trying to show you what happens behind the sta- behind the scenes, and um, literally what's happening, as you've just described, Julius, is that she's the little girl. She's standing there. She's kind of the centre of everybody's attention because. You know, she's the daughter of the king and queen, so she belongs to this kind of celestial realm that the rest of them don't. Um, and they're all sort of, in a way, you know, hovering around her, you know, like, 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 um, you know, planets around the sun or something. They're in rotation in relation to her. Um, and something's happening to make them shift. So, and this I think is really important maybe isn't isn't focused on enough when people talk about it. Um, something's happening. Something's happened to make them all um, sort of shift in their positions um, and and something almost something's unsettled the equilibrium of the room. You even see the infanta's 
her face is looking in one direction exactly. and her eyes are just glancing at us so she's just realised exactly. something's there. Yep. Something's happening. So, so there's one, I mean, there are different interpretations. There's probably the interpretation that I would probably uh, follow is that what's happened is that the king and queen have just come in to see what's going on um, and, every, and most of the people in the painting are not aware that they're there yet, and they're actually so. In fact, I'd read the I'd read the reflection in the in the painting at the back as a reflection of them looking into the painting. Mm. So you do read that as not a reflection of the painting, but a reflection of us as the viewer. Yeah, but but the viewer is a king and queen in that mm. sense. Um, and 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 so as I say, the only people who are aware of the king and queen's presence are, are who's just becoming aware um, are the infanta who who you know sees her parents as it were, and Velasquez who stands back and just starts to see what's going on. Um, and actually, one of the most amazing figures is the figure off to the right, which is. Um, Another, there are actually two dwarfs off to the right. There's one dwarf who's kicking the dog. Now that, that dwarf is not yet um, on the on the extreme right. That dwarf is not yet aware um, that the king and queen are there. Obviously, if that dwarf realised that the king and queen were there, that dwarf would you know stand to attention and behave. Do, do you think it is a dwarf? Because I've, I've I've read other analyses where it does say that that figure is a dwarf, but it looks. Yeah, looks it looks like, like a little boy. Yeah, I know, like but it's boy. actually well. Apparently, it's a it's a dwarf, and right. there's another painting by Marzo that shows that dwarf as well, um, and he he sort of looks like the same person. Mm. So anyway, whatever it is, the figure's kicking the dog, and the dog see the dog hasn't even the dog doesn't feel the kick yet. It's it's that instantaneous moment. It's it's the sort of snapshot. It's an amazing painting in that way, mm. and then. The figure behind or beside that the kicking figure is is another dwarf. Is certainly a dwarf, and um, that figure's face is all blurry, and that figure is just looking out at us. And 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 if you look at that figure really carefully, and and, and the, the the listeners will have to really you know have a look at a, a good um, a good reproduction. Uh, you'll see that that face is is kind of all blurry and it's almost like, well, it's like a snapshot, but it's also in the sense that the figure doesn't see the significance of what the figure is seeing yet. So in other words, the figure's seeing the king and queen but hasn't recognised them yet. It's like it's seeing, seeing things in low resolution. Exactly. And then the maid servant, um, the maid in waiting immediately to the left of the figure I've just described, she's starting to curtsy because she can actually, she's recognised the figure, the, the, she, she's seen them already and she's starting to um, appropriately respond. Whereas the figure on the other side uh, of the Infanta, um, on the left side of her, she's like still totally fixated, totally focused on the Infanta. She hasn't even seen the King and Queen yet and she's I think she's, she's offering the Infanta a cup of tea or something. She's offering her something and and she's totally unaware of their presence. So, so the brilliance, so in sum, the brilliance of the painting, among other things, is it shows all these instantaneous moments of recognition or not recognition. It's a painting about seeing... And recognizing or not recognizing, as the case may be, in in an instantaneous mm. moment of time. Mm. Do you think Philip the Fourth would have been insulted by being depicted as a miniature blurred reflection, or do you think the relationship with Velazquez was such that? I I, th- I think that you know he he, rec- he 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 recognized the uniqueness of the work, so he. Um, so he would have loved it, but but yeah, the the point you, you you are making a really important point about to what degree is it would it have been um, permissible during that time to to show an artist and other like normal people in the presence of the king and queen of Spain? And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm asking as a rhetorical question. The answer is it would not have been permissible. It would it, that was really not appropriate you you never see a painting of the king and queen of spain you know standing next to 
a commoner, and, and unless there's a really important, like it's a historical painting of you know the the, the taking of the town of whatever, um, um, uh, you know, a royal portrait shows them by themselves or doing something important. It would never show them just hanging around with people in in, in a room. Do Do you think that's partly why it was? Because very little is actually known about Las Meninas or about contemporary interpretations of it. And as I understand it, the first record of it uh, was from a document from the Last Will and Testament of Philip IV four years after he died. So do you think that it was kept quite secret as a painting because of that context? Uh, I mean, I think... I think I, I, I think I don't, I don't, I don't see, I think it's more it's an intimate thing. It's not something that normal mm. normal most people would get a chance to see. I think it, it just shows that Velasquez has re, you know has risen to such a degree in the king's estimation and they've become quote unquote friends to the degree that that you know, Velasquez has become allowed in. You know, he's been ent- he's been allowed into the sort of family mm. that this kind of elaborate game is allowed. And then, and the final thing I'll say is that um, it, it's important to note, and, and, and all that what what we're saying here is, it's actually the reflection of the king and queen that he's shown in conjunction with, not the actual king and queen. So I, I actually think that Velasquez. He, it's part of what's so brilliant about it. He, I don't think he would have been able to show this and the actual king and queen there standing in the room. That would have been too, mm. you know, crazy and 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 um, indecorous, as it were. Mm. So he's got no, so so his attempt to show himself in the company of the king and queen it is so elaborate and interestingly staged. He's done it by showing him in the company of a reflection of the king and queen mm. rather than the actual physical bodies of the king and queen because that would be too much. Mm. And even more than that, it's a reflection of the painting of the king and the queen because yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah, hard to yeah. tell with this but when I'll upload a photo of it to the uh, podcast Instagram so people can see but the, the reflection that we see isn't actually at the vanishing point of the picture plane. The vanishing point is just here. So this actually angles out that way apparently. Yes. So the reflection that we see, it's obviously debatable, but obviously Velazquez meant it to be misconstrued and meant it to be ambiguous. But uh, that's an interesting point you make then. It wasn't. It would have been too indecorous to actually paint the king and queen alongside Velazquez so instead he's done a reflection of them. So I think it probably would have been put in, in, a, in a room you know, in a semi-private room and would have been enjoyed as a, as a, like this really incredible but, you know, kind of experimental, you know, cutting-edge weird thing, you mm. know, um, that, that, that Velasquez, this amazing painter, has been able to do. Oh, and, and the, other, I mean, the other thing is, so saying all that, I mean, another, you got to, it's also worth asking, um, I think an important question to ask of the painting is, you know, why did Velasquez go to all the trouble from his own point of view to do this? Mm. And, and I think that, I mean, part of it was also very much about social status um, and 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 he's trying to sort of, I guess, doc, I mean, among, among other things, he's trying to document the social status that he has attained by being you know, in the bosom of the you know royal mm. family for so long, um, so it's it's a kind of a document of what he's achieved with his life, as it were, and of course a very important um, sign of that is the cross of um, the San Sebastian, yeah, knighthood um, of San, yeah, the Santiago of Santiago, I think it is actually. Yeah, I'll look it up. Um, the, 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 the um, sort of aristocratic order that he's got um, painted on his, uh, on, 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 on his breast there, which um, is, is, was represented one of the, you know, major social achievements of his entire career. Basically, it's admitting him into, at least symbolically, the ranks of the aristocracy, even though he wasn't. It's like a knightly order. Um, His skill as a painter has elevated has, him from exactly, common man to Exactly, exactly, which is a, obviously a huge achievement. Mm. And part of the um, part of the um, sort of the, I guess, the preparations or whatever that they had to do to admit him into that order 
was to supposedly check that he was noble. Of course, he's not noble, so they, they, they had to sort of bend the rules, as it were, to, to let him in, and mm. obviously they did that because of the king. So anyway, that's, 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 a, that's another really key, I guess, you know, symbol within the painting. That's him sort of summing up all that he's managed to get to in his life as a result of his relationship mm. with the king and queen. It almost seems throughout Velazquez's career the, the skill that distinguishes him from his contemporaries is his ability to ennoble the subject matter. You can see it in his portrait of Juan de Pariah, in the house of Martha and Mary, he's constantly painting the common man as if they were the nobility and it's why I think this is the culmination of that is he's almost inverted that process rather than the subject matter being ennobled, we're being ennobled. Looking at it, that's an interesting um, way of seeing it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And the painting's got this almost uh, alchemical nature, where for the time the viewer's looking at it, he or she has the lifestyle of a royal simulated for them. I mean, the rest, yeah, as we were saying before, the rest of the family or the rest of the uh, court uh, is almost just looking at us as if we've just appeared. Did you know the you see the two paintings at the top behind yes. him as well? Yes, I was watching a, uh, a lecture on it in the lead-up to this podcast, apparently that's uh, Peter Paul Rubens' depiction of the Flame of Marcius by Apollo. Oh, right. And okay. uh, Arachne versus Athena in uh, the weaving contest. And so both examples of mortals challenging gods in the arts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then it's kind of like what Velazquez is doing with this painting is sort of sh- sh- challenging or putting his ability to paint on the same pedestal as the gods. Absolutely. And and but, well that's interesting. I mean, so yeah, but 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 the but the point of both both those stories is that the mortals get punished. Mm. So I guess he's slight again, it's a sort of a, a not tongue in cheek, but it's a jest for kind of thing, and that he's aware that on the one hand he's he he has a godlike power. That's what art that's what we now recognise art to have. And that itself was a big thing in Spain this period because it wasn't really the way art was seen prior to that. Um, but at the same time, he realises there's limits, you know. <laughs> so you don't want to, you know, um, fl- fly too close to the sun, as it were. Be more or deferential you, about yeah, it. Yeah, you've got to be a little bit deferential about it because um, after all, those two examples that he cites are people who, artists, or particularly um, Marcius, uh, who, who who did compete with the gods and were punished for it. So he's... I wonder what he's trying to say with that, though. Well, he's sort of doing both things. He's saying I'm respectful of my, of, of my limits. <laughs> but on the other hand, I'm really great because mm. I have this power. Look what I can do, you know. Mm. And even the aspect ratio of the painting itself is similar to the aspect ratio of the two paintings. Do you notice that as well? Like That's interesting. Them. Yeah, I mean it's beautiful the, the way there's so much on a simple level. There's so much space in the mm. painting. It's it's uh, it, it 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 is it is a, such a great painting and it's so unusual in so many so many reasons. Mm. Uh, Luca Giordano, who's one of my favourite painters, who who came and had a look at it a few years later, said it was the theology of painting, mm. which is pretty pretty close to true. I think. Do you think it's one of the greatest works of art ever? Oh yeah, definitely. And as I say, I'm um, seeing it in the Prado in this sort of dark mm. room where you see it. In, you know, it, it really does look like a real thing, and it's mm. and you, you have to pinch yourself. It's uh, the illusionism is is quite amazing. But as but as I said, and as we've been discussing, I mean, on the one hand, it is illusionistically um, exceptional, but on the other hand, it's it's actually um, incredibly sort of symbolic. Um, so it's not, it's not, it's, yeah, it's, it's not just what you see. It's, it's sort of what you see combined with what that all means. And, and it's, it still has a lot of mystery about it for that reason, I find. And he sort of makes the viewer the subject and man- manipulates the viewer's interaction with the painting almost on a similar level to how Leonardo does with the Mona Lisa. Don't you think it's got that same alchemical kind of transform yeah it draws us in in this weird way yeah the psychology of looking at the psychology of those sorts of paintings Mm. um there are not many that have that kind of thing where they draw us in yeah it's rare that two artistic geniuses will not only know each other but will actually get along with each other 
what do you think Velazquez's relationship with Rubens was like? And just for the listeners, could you describe Rubens' impact on the Western canon of art? Uh, well, I mean, I, 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 Rubens was hugely impactful on 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 Velazquez. Um, Rubens was obviously a very, very um, successful. Um, you, you, you like he, he was successful in a way I think that 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 um that Velasquez would have liked to achieve but never did. Um, Rubens was like a kind of an international superstar, as it were. Um, Velasquez did travel a little bit um to it to Italy a couple of times, but Rubens was a sort of um not just an artist but a very successful diplomat slash courtier, and he travelled quite a lot throughout Europe, including coming to Spain. I kind of always picture um, him as like a Benjamin Franklin yeah, kind of figure. Or. Urbane kind of um, able to deal with all sorts of different people and um, not just, not you know, not... So in, in other respects, like some of the, some of the jobs or, or that he was, he was given were, were in some senses of, of, of higher than artistic significance. He was given important diplomatic... Roles and and messages to send, um, you know, to 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 the kings and queens that he was visiting. Um, so, in any event, back to Velasquez and, and Rubens. So, I think that Rubens was an important model to Velasquez for this kind of more um, international, for him, I guess, global picture of what an artist can be. Velasquez was incredibly successful, but. Spain was a relatively closed um, society. Um, a little bit, I think it's a bit like, I mean, without being um, without being um, too superficial about the, the analogy, but I think it's a little bit like with uh, like contemporary Chinese art or something like Ai Weiwei or something like that. Like he's an unbelievably brilliant, successful artist from a culture that although it's, um, it's politically like Spain in the 17th century was politically incredibly dominant, um, you know, a superpower, etc. But it was considered culturally speaking, um, you know, much less developed um, than, you know, the centre of the art world was Italy. And um, similarly, you know, Rubens had this kind of urbane, you know, international experience that Velasquez could never hope to match. So... So Velázquez and, and the sort of Spanish, um, I guess, tradition of painting that he represents or, or, or kind of is the ultimate um, example of is this kind of kind of new, you know, brash kind of but slightly, you know, feeling a bit regional and a little bit like with a slight chip on its shoulder, like how am I going to break through on a more global kind of stage Velasquez hasn't really made that transition at that stage in the 17th century during his own lifetime because he was, you know, in the end, all he, I mean, he, you know, he, he achieved many things, but in the end, you know, he was a servant to the king of king of king of um, Spain. He wasn't, you know, a, an artist that everybody knew about all over the world. Mm. But Rubens was an artist that everybody knew all over the world. So. So I, 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 besides being a friend, I think he was a, you know, a sort of, I, don't, I guess, I guess someone that Velazquez would have looked up to somewhat. Mm. Do you think Velazquez, I feel like after Velazquez meets Rubens, you see maybe not an ability to but more interest in shoving more, concentrating more figures into the picture plane in the same way, you know, Rubens is famous for having, you know, hundreds of figures just squashed into a canvas and, and it's never too busy, it's never too much going on. So he's the master of composition in that sense. I mean, you even see it in Las Meninas, the way, you know, it's most people would struggle to depict that many figures in close quarters like that without it looking too busy. Do you think uh, Velazquez learned a lot compositionally from Rubens? Yeah. Um, again, I think, I, think, I think Rubens has a sort of an adroitness, doesn't he? He can just, he can do, I mean, he, he can do things either, either, either on a very large scale or on a very small scale and he makes it look like it's, it's all easy work. Um, 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 so he's sort of the consummate um, technician and a professional. So um, he had a capacity to do, to do anything. Um, and I think that um, 
yeah, that would have been really, really important for Velasquez. But I think that I think that um, he, he learned a lot from from Rubens. But probably I would say his his more his abiding um, influence probably would have more been just studying Titian's paintings. I think Titian's don't forget that the collection of paintings by Titian in the Prado. Um, it's massive. It's the best collection of his paintings in the world. Why is that? Why were there so many Titians in this? Well, country? because among other things, Charles V, who was the um, the king of Spain, when Spain sort of really hit its straps as in the middle of the 16th century as the absolute superpower, um, he became Titian's major patron and also collector and he basically hoovered up all of the paintings by Titian that he possibly could. He, he commissioned work from Titian but he also bought work um, by Titian and also, of course, and that's what really begins the whole collection of the Prado and, and it be begins the sort of art boom in Spain Um in the um, 17th century, uh, sorry, the 16th century that then flows on into the 17th century into Philip IV and Velazquez, mm -hmm. um, in that, of course, all the courtiers, all, all the royal court realised that the best way to um, curry favour with King, King Charles, with, with the Emperor King, uh, Charles V or, you know, the other, the subsequent kings and queens of Spain was to give them paintings, was to give them artworks. So... Um, it, Every um, diplomat, you know, courtier who went off to um, Naples or Rome or whatever, they were expected to bring back, you know, beautiful paintings to give to the king of um, to, to give to the king to the royal court in Madrid. So it's no wonder that um, you know by the middle of the 17th century and even during Charles V's time, you know, the collection um, in Madrid was among the best in the world. And certainly, because he was absolutely obsessed with Titian, the, the collection of Titians was was definitely the best in the world. Would he have seen that uh, portrait of a young man by Titian where the sleeve is sort of exiting the picture plane and breaking that fourth wall? Do you know that? Is that the one in the National Gallery in London? Oh, maybe it is. And the, the one with the blue sleeve. Yeah. Um, because that's almost... Okay, I've got to think about that. No, because I think that if, if it's the one I think of, it, it was in the collection of the Gonzaga of Mantua uh, and um, and they ultimately, I think, sold their collection to the royal family in in, in England, uh, to Charles I. Because you could almost see in that the genesis of that idea of breaking down the Yeah, the but wall. I mean, for sure, that, I mean, a painting like that would have been incredible. I mean, he, he, he studied Titian very, very carefully, obviously. The, the, the amazing, um, you know, bravura um, um, brush, brush, brush strokes that he developed um, mm. w w was all from Titian, really, yeah. In a technical sense, do you think there's ever been a more prodigious artist than Velazquez? I'm, I'm, think, um, I'm thinking in particular of the Bodegonia paintings he did when he was 18 or 19. Well, I love them. They're great. But, I mean, they're very different. I mean, they're, obviously they're more closely modelled. They, they, they lack that sort of more open. They're more um, polished. Yeah. Um, hmm. The, the, the Bodegonas, i got to say, they're, t they're a very different thing and I could talk about them for a long time. Um, the, I, I personally, my feeling is that you... They are brilliant and and they're incredibly vivid evocations of, um, you know, um, humble, you know, um, people. Um, but I think that it, it's kind of wrong and, and potentially misleading to interpret them as being kind of really sympathetic representations of um, lower class, you know, people, humble people, um, um, low social status, uh, status people. Um, he, he certainly in one level represents these people with this incredible vivacity that's charming and, and, and um, brilliant, brilliant obviously, but they're made for... Um, aristocratic collectors. Originally, they would have been originally painted for civilian aristocratic collectors who were interested in these people. It was called low-life painting um, uh, and and it, they, they were interested in them in, in one, in an almost anthropological sense in that 
they found it kind of interesting to to sort of study the lifestyles, as it were, of, of people that were utterly unlike them. But two, they there was often something a little bit ridiculous, a little bit um, burlesque about the paintings. Um, Do you think that's how Velazquez saw them, though, or just how they were uh, interpreted by the people who bought them? Well, I mean... You, you Again, get that's, a, that's a great question, but I mean, I, the way I, I'd yeah. see it is I guess he's painted them for these patrons. He's he's representing the values that he thinks that he wants the patrons to, you know, to get from them. So I think in that sense he also reflects the same values that the patrons have. Mm. But 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 look, I... I, 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 I could I could feel you go oh no but they're brilliant and it's true they are brilliant and and they they do I mean they're not just demean, you know they're not demeaning they 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 show these figures with this incredible um you know in one dignity. sense yeah dignity sympathy mm. look they're brilliant paintings but but I don't th- I just saying. He's not the social justice warrior. No, People hold him up to be. It's not, no, it's not like it's <laughs> yeah, not yeah. like what we see today. You yeah. know what I mean? But like if, often, there's also allegories about religious things and about you know Christian values mm. and. But it's amazing how he straddles that world between. I mean, we we know him as the great painter of monarchy, but we also know him as the, the great painter of the downtrodden. Yes. I mean, you just have to look at the portraits of the dwarves. The court dwarves that he did, and he just paints them with the same nobility that he'd paint King Philip the Fourth. I, I I totally agree. But again, do you think? Re, I'm, just, I'm asking another <laughs> rhetorical question. Do you think that those um, those court members, when they saw those paintings, do you think they would think they're no, noble on the same no. level as? So they're totally brilliant. Though. They are so brilliant, and mm. I love them. I love them to death. And, and 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 the point is that we can identify with them in in ways that we want. Like we can see that those levels of sympathy in them, mm. and I do too. Um, I find them incredibly poignant. In some ways, I think the the ones of the you know the dwarves and the fools and the they for me they're some of the most um, you know they're like Diane Arbus photos or something. They're so they're so beautiful and it, revealing. It's strange um, when the, the great artists um, always seem to have timeless morals. If that makes sense, uh, you know, Shakespeare. Yeah, you absolutely. wouldn't you wouldn't expect a, a you know early seventeenth century man to be able to give such a profound commentary on race at, in his time, and yet he does. Uh, and the same with Velazquez. You know whether he was painting it for posterity or. Uh, for for the buyers, he, he just seems to have a ethical moral standard that is never going to be uh, superseded. Mm. They mm. see deeply. That's why we like art. You know, mm. that's what art's for. The, the emphasis on the downtrodden and the depiction of biblical scenes amongst the poor was Caravaggio the first to do this, and was it his example? Do you think that Velazquez was following? Um, again, that's a really good question. Um, he, he he again. He wasn't the first. That, 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 this is a whole other you know thing. This is a whole other topic that I would take too long to to, to, to bore you with. But I've got as long as you've got, Chris. Well, he Caravaggio. Uh, yes, I mean he was incredibly revolutionary, and um, uh, basically those early Bodegones that we we're just talking about. Um, in that darker, tenebrous um, style that Velasquez starts off with in the um, 16, uh, so 1620s, they, they are directly derived from Caravaggio's paintings, Caravaggio's Carava- Caravaggesque um, style, the chiaroscuro dark kind of tenebrous style with, with like spotlit figures with this really And a more bright... claustrophobic space. Exactly. Mm. Um, so, so Velasquez is directly influenced by Caravaggio. But the weird thing is actually he probably didn't see original paintings by Caravaggio because they hadn't actually arrived in Spain yet, but, but he probably saw copies. So anyway, yeah, Velasquez is very, very much influenced by uh, Caravaggio and one of Caravaggio's basic... Um, you know, innovations is is of course to show um, biblical figures with 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 this incredible um, kind of um, you know down to earth veracity naturalist um, approach, but he didn't. I mean, he didn't actually invent that. That 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 does actually come from a tradition of um, 16th century, particularly Lombard painting, painting around Milan. Um, like he was trained by a person called. Petezzano, Simone Petezzano, and there's a whole 
it's actually a beautiful school of um of, of sort of late um, 16th century Milanese Lombard North Italian painting that 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 is very much um, well it's like one step back from Caravaggio it's like it's like almost like like a, like a, a combination of um, Titian like we're just talking about Titian and and um, you know Venetian naturalism 16th century Venetian naturalism. Um, and, and, and a kind of more earthy, pungent kind of um, style that particularly takes root in this area, Lombardy, where, where Caravaggio starts. And actually the other big influence um, for that is Leonardo because Leonardo went to Milan and, um, and um, some of his uh, paintings obviously were left there and were really, really influential. So it's almost like a combination of Venetian painting, Leonardo, um, it's all sort of percolating through Lombardy during the late 16th century and this is the sort of workshop tradition that Caravaggio comes out of, comes down to Rome paints these paintings and everyone's blown away because they've never seen things like this before. Um, things like what? Just well, for, the, the, the boy with the basket of fruit, for mm. instance, the early genre painting, Scenes of Everyday Life. Um, and um, The realism as well. Yeah, they, they mm. cause, because particularly at Rome, where Caravaggio first becomes really famous, um, the prevailing style at that stage was called Mannerism, which was a much more sort of elaborate... Um, Sort of the worst um, of the Renaissance, I've always thought of it. Yeah, well, you know, I like everything. I mean, everything's good in different ways, yeah. but it was a it's a very sophisticated sort of a style, and 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 Caravaggio's mm. earthy realism really took the Roman art scene by storm. Yeah. Mm. Do you subscribe to David Hockney's secret knowledge argument? And just for the listeners, could you explain what that is? I, I no, I don't really. But no, not really. <laughs> Could you explain what it is, though, for the? Oh no, you you, you explain it, and I'll I'll um I, I read it like, and I sort Ooh. of. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit too neat, yeah, and a bit too tidy, yeah. But it's pretty yeah. much uh, David Hockney, who's arguably the most famous living artist uh, today, wrote a thesis where he spoke about. It's called a. He argued that the artists of the late Renaissance and the early Baroque period used a camera obscura, which is. Uh, primitive form of a camera which would uh, reflect uh, or would, would project uh, a, a real image onto a canvas for when the artist sketched it up and uh, there's this big moment in art history where painting becomes a lot more realistic and David Hockney points to that as a potential theory for why that happened. But you're sceptical. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's been a while since I've read, I have to say, I, I, yes, I did read it all and... Um, I had to go into it in some detail, but my memory is that um, well, it's a bit neat, as you said, and also it's a bit literal. It's like, I mean, you know, it'd be, it's it's like it's like sort of it's like the complexity of all of these things, and you've got one little pretty basic technique or something that you that you think solves you know all the problems. Um, uh, contingent on you know what I'm saying is is the reality of of the sort of processes of the development of you know 16th century into 17th century art and realism becoming much you know working its way in all these different ways is much more complex and elaborate and less kind of it's less about I mean, if it was as easy as just getting a camera obscure, you know, and setting it up, and then we we all suddenly discover you know that's not the I guess I'm saying that's not the way art history works. Yes. You know, artists use lots of things and they use, you know, visual technology to to help them um, produce their work, of course. Um, but but that doesn't sort of answer, you know, solve all the problems and things that they're working through. I think also on a technical level there's a whole question as to whether the camera obscura you know, it was actually available. Worked. Mm. Well, if it worked quite as effectively as they said, it, 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 or he says it did, and whether it was even available to Caravaggio, whereas in the 17th century, you know, there's more to, later on, and particularly in, um, you know, Holland and places, there's obviously more to be said for um, the camera obscure being uh, a recognised, you know, tool that you could use. But, see, that's a little bit later. So, 
Yeah, I, it's like one of those things. As I say, I'm, I'm not really expressing it properly, but it's one of those things. It's too neat. It's you'd like, see you'd see evidence of trial and error more in the lead. That's how yeah. it works. That's yeah. how everything works. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Actually, it's like saying I don't know Jimi Hendrix. You know, oh no, but you know the thing that makes Jimi Hendrix great is you know he's like the new the new you know fuzzbox wah wah. You know he wouldn't be nothing, but suddenly we had a fuzzbox wah wah, and then yeah. bang, here comes Jimi Hendrix. Well, no, Jimi Hendrix is great because he's fantastic, not because of a you know fuzzbox. You know Speaks out to Luke's too much. Yeah. Uh, talking about technique and back to Velazquez. Did Velazquez make preparatory sketches before starting any of his paintings? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. Oh, well, I mean, I'm not on so the canvas itself. People, though. people would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. I mean, I mean, no. He 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 made preparatory sketches, but um, this goes back to the issue we we've been talking about a little bit about the status of art in Spain in the seventeenth century, and the status of art, relatively speaking, in Spain in the seventeenth century was not as high as it as in um, Italy or the rest of Europe. So. People didn't really collect drawings um, in the way that they collect drawing collected drawings in Europe, in Italy particularly. Um, I mean, the, the 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 cabinets of you know prints and drawings um, in the great museums, like the Uffizi or whatever, they they grow out of you know great collections. People who collected um, drawings because they. Recognise drawings as you know things that helped you understand art better. Well, well, the appreciation of art in Spain, relatively speaking and in general, hadn't advanced to that stage where there were people who were actively in in, in great numbers collecting drawings. So you know, um, Velázquez almost certainly did do drawings, um, but. No one collected them, and then B, um, you know, they just got lost. I think there was a big fire in the Alcazar or something in the early 18th century. There's a theory that a lot of his possessions um, got destroyed at a certain stage. It's too. pretty sad. Yeah. Mm. Velázquez is also one of the best painters with black pigment. Why do you think that black is so synonymous with Spanish painters? Mm. Um, I, again, I, I don't like to go into big, you know, deep cultural things, but, I mean, clearly there is something <laughs> about black and Spain and, I mean, I, I love Goya. Uh, okay, I, I want to get going on to that. But um, there's something about the sense of the darkness and the, the decorum, you know, think about all the black um, clothing. Um, black is just very Spanish devotional. It's just something that they, that they really got. They're very hard to paint <laughs> with as well. It's hard to paint well with, yeah, yeah which you, you, you know better than me. Mm. What was the significance of mirrors, do you think, to Velazquez as well? Because it seems to me that he'll often use mirrors as a visual device, again, to break that fourth wall and engage the actual space that the viewer occupies. I'm thinking the Rockaby Venus, uh, House of Martha and Mary um, and Las Meninas, of course. It, it extends space, doesn't it? But it also, it's, it's a compositional device to allow you to flatten space and 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 um you know represent like 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 it's it's a world in a world but it's also a kind of a flat surface that that schemat schematically renders a three-dimensional form so i i like the way in 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 his mirrors that it, it both suggests depth but also you know the surface it doesn't use up much real estate in the picture either but yeah. conveys heaps of yeah, space yeah, with that. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, the other artwork I wanted to uh, discuss was Michelangelo's David. So going back around 100 years before Velazquez was born, can you explain the events that led to Michelangelo receiving that commission and maybe also explain the cultural context within which the David was made? Uh, wow, okay. Well, 1501 to 1504, Michelangelo gets the, um, gets the commission for the David. Um, the David is a huge, it's a 5.17 metre uh, sculpture, which, of course, most, most of us know is pretty iconic. But it was actually originally intended um, to be on the, um, like, the top of the drum of Florence Cathedral. Um, um, and, of course, Florence Cathedral 
had been uh, was being continuously built. It was it was um, built particularly by Brunelleschi in the 15th century, but by the very beginning of the 16th century, obviously they've they've finished the kind of the basic. Uh, almost the bones, if you like, the structure of the architecture, and they're starting to think, and they've done the, 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 the cupola and well, they've done most of it, and it's like, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And they're, they're, they're getting to think about how to um, decorate the, the outside um, of, the, um, of, of, of the cathedral. And so, yeah, so, so, so the David was a, was a, was, he's, a, he's, a, he's a prophet, he's a biblical prophet, um, which is an appropriate um, subject for the Cathedral of um, Florence, you know, religious subject, um, and he's meant to be like many, 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 many metres high up in space um, on the top of the drum next to the dome um, of Florence Cathedral as part of this uh, as I say, as part of this commission to sort of populate the outside of the cathedral with all of these big statues, which which they've been doing for a long time. I mean, because as I say, other parts of the cathedral have been finished earlier. Um, the facade, um, they'd got Donatello to do big sculptures earlier on in the 15th century, so now they're at this stage. Um, but the other very important thing to bear in mind about this commission is that, um, and, and something that makes it an even greater achievement than um, in some ways it is just when you look at it, um, you have to sort of appreciate this, is that the block of marble that Michelangelo used, and, and he's in his mid-20s in this stage, he's, 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 he's very successful, he's not yet the you know greatest and most powerful artist in, in Italy. That will come soon when he then finishes off his work in Florence and goes down to Rome to work for the, the, the Pope Julius II. But he's, but he's, but he's, you know, he's, he's, he'd just he's under, on the way. He's he'd on just the way. Pietà, hadn't yeah, he's he on the was... way to becoming pretty, pretty well known. Um, anyway, so he gets his commission to do David uh, for Florence Cathedral in 1501. But um, the marble block that he's given is, in fact, a marble block that's just been sitting about in the uh, the Opera del Duomo, which is like the workshop for Florence Cathedral. It's been sitting about for about 40 years, quote-unquote cooked, they called it, which means it's just been sitting about um, exposed to the elements, the sun rained on, etc. cetera, uh, because two other artists had had a chance or had tried to um, work on this commission and, and had not been able to complete the commission prior to Michelangelo. And... Um, the first one was Agostino di Duccio, and he'd roughed out this marble, big marble block that he'd um, uh, selected from Carrara, which is where the marble uh, that they use in that area comes from, and he brought it all the way down, massive, you know, as you can imagine, a huge um, slab of marble, uh, and he'd started work on it um, um, Maybe he'd roughed out the legs and he'd done the basic sort of dimensions of the sculpture... And then he just didn't finish it um, for one reason or another. And then it was given to another artist called Rossellino and he also didn't get around to doing it. It was, I don't know, something about the commission that was very hard. The, 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 as I say, the, the, the marble was kind of compromised as well. Um, and then Michelangelo, the third one, um, picks up this this contract and um, because, you know, they don't have, you know, massively huge bits of marble just sitting about, he has to work on the bit, the block of marble that's been given to him. Um, and he comes up with obviously, you know, one of the great greatest um, construction, greatest creations in the history of art. But anyway, to finish off this particular part of the story, the, the, the particular dimensions of the sculpture and the sort of some of the very weird elements of the sculpture probably are um, explained by the fact that Michelangelo was extremely constrained by the shape of the marble block that he was already using. So um, among all the, all the things, you, you know, one could say about the finished sculpture of David by Michelangelo, it is very elongated. It's kind of weirdly, if you look at it, just, you know, just look at it as a, as a, as a body. It's a very elongated, elongated, strange body. 
and um, the head's very big. The hand, uh, the right hand, is is very big. Um, the legs, you know, strangely kind of um, almost distorted. Um, and so the the, the two um, the two um, reasons given for that is is one the fact that 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 he's working with this strangely slender, already partly modelled block, and two. He's also thinking about something that is going to be viewed from way, 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 way up high. So he wants to, um, for, because of the extreme foreshortening and the fact that you can hardly see the thing um, if it had been installed in the position that it was actually created for, uh, you, you needed to see the head and the hand in particular larger than they actually were. Is it also, though, because the figuration of an adolescent youth has features like that where the head will grow faster than the body, the hands, certain limbs grow before other parts of the body do. And Michelangelo being probably the best anatomist of all time was aware of those kinds of uh, the way the body develops in that way. And do you think it was more that or more the the perspective? I put, I put it at the perspective myself because, um, I mean, you know, yeah, that's, that's possible. It's just... Um, if you look at all the other statues of David um, by other artists like Donatello or Verrocchio, I mean, Verrocchio's, Donatello's David is very well known because um, that's like Michelangelo's one is um, entirely nude. That's the um, the bronze by Donatello from the early 15th mm. century, so it's kind of like 100 years earlier. Um, but there's also one by Verrocchio um, from the 1470s, so that's like 25 years or so earlier, and um, he's got that same adolescent youthful air, but it's a lot more kind of standard and it doesn't have any of those features we're talking about. But look, it, it may be, you know, it may be. I mean, everything about Michelangelo is is unique. He, he thinks everything through from first principles, so... Whatever it is, it, it, it's it's it, you know if you suddenly look at it from that way, you think, wow, why is his hand so big? It's very odd. Well, because I've just often thought when they got the committee together to designate where it would be placed, I would have thought he would have been more devastated when he realised it wasn't being put up high because he would have been like, well, I've made the, I've, I've sculpted it. Uh, specifically for it to be placed up high, I would have thought he would have been a bit more devastated when he when they just said they were going to keep it um, at eye level. So yeah, well, I mean, on one level that's true, but but I mean, obviously on, on another level he would have been thankful, I suppose, because you know in the end they decided to put it in the uh, Piazza della Signoria in a very very prominent spot, but also it needs to be you know um, stressed in a spot that was um, very. Um, politically loaded in a civic, almost propagandistic sense because the, that piazza in front of the, um, the uh, what's now called the Palazzo Vecchio but at that stage was essentially the, the town hall of, well, it still is the town hall of Florence, but it, it, it was the... Uh, Built like a fortress. All of the, mm. its, its entire um, function at that stage was to be the town hall of Florence. So it was the civic centre of the city and it was a city where... Um, sorry, it was the space of the city where they kind of declared their identity via statuary. Mm. So there's also a statue called the Mazzocco by Donatello, which is a huge lion holding a lily, and that's a symbol of strength, obviously. And then there's a statue by Donatello of Judith and Holofernes. Actually, it was taken away, but in Michelangelo's time it was in, in, that, in that zone. And that's a statue. Very, it's a very, it's a very comparable statue to David because it's a statue of a biblical um, hero, biblical heroine in this in this situation, who who overcomes um, a a uh, you know a, a, an evil foe um, through the strength of her you know conviction and 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 um, moral righteousness. Mm. Which is just, of course, the same story of David um, in a in a in you know in a, in, a, in a male setting. So they complement each other very well. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, when they decided to put David in the Piazza della Signoria rather than up on the, um, the uh, on, on the top of the Duomo on the top of the cathedral, he 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 in effect he went from being a biblical prophet to being a symbol of the power of Florence as a republic. To withstand, um, you know, f 
any foe, including foes, enemies that were um, politically, logistically, militarily bigger than them because they had God on their side. So he became a really powerful political symbol. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so if it was in, outside the Duomo, it takes on a much more biblical significance. If it's outside the Palazzo della Signoria, it takes on a more political That's right, uh, yeah. Mind. Could you explain Michelangelo's approach to sculpture, his, his philosophy of sculpture, the idea that he's not creating anything but merely revealing God's work and just how sort of beautiful and revolutionary this idea uh, approach was? Yeah, well... Again, it's kind of a complicated. There's a lot to it. I mean, in, in essence, it's it's um, uh, and it's also debated a bit as well. But um, a lot of it derives from Neoplatonism. Neoplatonism is a um, it's a sort of you know it's a philosophical um, Renaissance humanist movement at that stage, and it, it's particularly an attempt to reconcile. Um, Greek uh, classical culture, um, philosophy, learning, ideas, etc., with Christian, um, with with Christian um, thinking, because obviously, I mean, prior to that, and and this is very, it's obviously also very important for, for for David and for the representation of the male nude, which is obviously a big part of what makes David so powerful, is that you know um, the the appreciation of classical art um, um, in a Christian world, um, which is obviously what, you know, Renaissance Florence was, you had to sort of negotiate. That was a tricky thing because obviously, technically speaking, um, the, 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 the Romans, the ancients, uh, they might have been great, but they were the persecutors of Christ and they were pagan, etc. So Neoplatonism was a, a really, it was a, it was a really useful tool for humanists, scholars, artists as well, as I say, to kind of take all of that classical thinking, particularly, um, you know, Plato and the th- theory of forms, etc., um, and then marry it, wed it with, um, with, with, with Christian ideas. And that sort of gave you, um, if you like, a pretext or, a, you know, a rationale to enable you to, to, to really appreciate classical art. And you're not doing it in a, in a pagan, you know, bad way. You're doing it in a, in a sort of a positive way. And that's kind of the interesting thing about the whole Renaissance in general. Is Indeed it is. It's the, I mean, a revival of... Uh, ancient ideas is almost antithetical to Christian ideas. Exactly, and and they're also, but that's the other. I mean, again, on a really basic level, often we think of you know the Renaissance as being oh we're reviving you know you know the the the, the classics etc. But they're not just reviving the classics; they're reinventing the classics in the most radical way imaginable. I mean, you look at again fundamental point here. I mean, you look at the David and you compare him with. Um, ancient sculpture and obviously he's clearly I mean Michelangelo has clearly studied um, ancient sculpture very very care- very carefully but but there's something totally different about the David the David kind of breathes seems to live has this anim- animation within him uh, not to mention almost a kind of a, a, a realism um, that 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 is very different from from ancient sculpture, and um, you know it doesn't. Have, it's like it not doesn't have that sort of soft or the kind of um, I don't know, soft focus, but the sort of idealization of of of, um, of ancient uh, sculpture of Roman copies after Greek sculptures, etc. It's just got this incredible vitality. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I think that's really fundamental about the David um, that really always blows me away when I when I look at it is the idea of which perhaps goes back to your point about Neoplatonism that we haven't really um, explained properly yet. But the idea of a spirit within um, one of the really fundamental things about David by Michelangelo is his expression, which is an amazing expression, David's expression, which seems to indicate. A kind of a sense of psychological depth, psychological um, intensity. It's very intense. It's like he's st- mm. he's, and, and the sense of the great um, battle, the great, the great obstacle, the great uh, challenge that that David has to overcome. That of course we know he will overcome because he has God on his side. But 
the the struggle is is kind of almost etched in this incredible expression uh, of interiority coming out to the surface that you get in um, in in Michelangelo's David. And if you compare that with 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 you know with with ancient sculpture, they they just seem extremely bland. Um, and 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 the interiority coming to the surface, the psychological depth of the, of the nude. That's one of the great things that Michelangelo does in the David. And it's like the great symbol of Republican defiance. Do you, do you think that more than any other biblical story, David and Goliath um, represents the triumph of the thinking man and that perhaps that's why Michelangelo and his contemporaries were so drawn to it as a story? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I mean, yes. I mean, because, because, because David was, was just a, you know, a humble... Um, you know, Shepherd. He, you know, he he, he was a boy, um, as it were, and he was he was hopelessly out out outgunned, as it were, by by Goliath, uh, this huge giant uh, clad in armor. Remember the story of David and Goliath is that David um, rejects. They try to they try to get him to put on armor when he when he when he um, goes out to battle the Philistine warrior, but he says, "No, no, God is my armor." That's what, of course, why he's depicted naked. Um, and um, yeah, as you as you say, um, he he outwits Goliath, doesn't he? Because he's smarter than Goliath, and and he uses his humble um, slingshot to 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 kill him. Um, and um, so, in other words, you don't have to be physically, um, you know, you don't have to be a beefcake to 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 you know. To take on the world and win. I mm. mean, that's just what, what artists wouldn't like. That story, you know. Time to get to the nitty gritty of it, Chris. Why do you think the penis is so small? <laughs> that's a kind of a, you know, I don't, I don't normally think about that. It's um, important. It's important for the narrative, I think. <laughs> well, you tell me your, your thought. I, I mean, I, well, okay, you tell me your thoughts, and I'll uh, and I'll and I'll give my, my my response. Is it possible? that Michelangelo was trying to convey the intense physical fear because of what David is confronting and in so doing emphasises David's resolve. You know, his body might be scared, but he's determined to defeat this monster. And in some sense, the juxtaposition between his physical fear and his resolve makes David even more admirable. You know, he's shitting himself. He's For sure. sh- shriveled up because of that. But, For sure. but his face is conveying this def- Republican defiance, just steely determination. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, okay, again, I'd say if you if you went back if if you look at ancient sculptures of 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 naked heroes or gods like the Apollo Belvedere or something like that, they're not very well endowed. No, they don't have huge <laughs> penises because in the ancient world, you know, having a big penis was you know considered a mark of um, monstrosity. Yeah, <laughs> uh, like satyrs have big erect penises. It's funny, and, you mm. know, like, like, um, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I was watching um, on YouTube, um, you know, uh, um, Mick Jagger, you know, the other the other night, and like, you know, it's like, God, the 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 the, the, um, the 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 very revealing, um, you know, jeans that they were wearing, like, well, like sticky fingers for that matter, uh, is the opposite of of what Michelangelo was into. They they felt that nice little, you know. <laughs> Polite penises. Polite penises. You know, you didn't have to. You, you know, you did. You didn't have to make too much of a thing about it. You made a thing about it via your, your overall command. Your, your, your you know, your, your, your control over what was happening. You didn't have to, you know, flaunt it perhaps but to think- the degree that you know, you, you Michael and you sorry, you um, you Mick Jaggers uh, and um, you Robert Plant. So you think you know, Michelangelo to- was more just channeling the kind of figuration you see in the ancient world rather than trying to say something that, about how well, scared well, that, that's, David was. That, that's, that's my take on it. But if, if you... If you if it's my studied if, penis if, if, and if art, wanna, Chris. <laughs> well, what I will say, no, I agree. And I will say, I mean, as someone who spent a lot of time in Florence walking around the streets of Florence for uh, months on end, I have seen so many terrible T-shirts and... Um, Tea towels, a- aprons, the aprons, yeah, the yeah, aprons yeah. with the with, with 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 the genitals, and um, I have to say that they are very very beautiful genitals. And um, uh, the thing that I perhaps would focus on is the pubic hair is really beautiful, and it has this incredible vitality and. Um, 
it's like the pubic hair is 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 talking to you as well if you if 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 you take right. the time to look at it. Right. Well, I think it's expressive. Why, yeah, it's expressive of the vitality of the soul that he's trying to show. Now I think of it, why does say the birth of Venus? Why do none of the uh, female figures in uh, depicted in art have pubic hair? Because obviously that's a much more recent. Yeah, well, I think Phenomenal. well now we get into gender studies and feminism. I mean, I, I mean, I think because because you, you can't let's, let's get into it. Sexuality, you can't flaunt sexuality for for, for women because it's considered threatening. Um, so to show, was it Ruskin who got married yeah, and, and, he, and was, he was scared and he thought, well, that's not <laughs> that that story put me off, Ruskin. I used to, I've got this copy right here, on painters. I was yeah. halfway through it and then I heard that story. No, I mean, what a prude. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so so that's that is definitely the, the just for strange the thing. just for the listeners. Ruskin on the night he married his uh, wife was disgusted that she had pubic hair. So because all he, all, he, all he knew was was ancient sculpture, which Pre-Raphaelite obviously yeah. obviously is. I mean, this is not really something. You know, Julius and I like to talk about that much, but um, <laughs> you know, they don't show vaginas, yeah. do they? They don't show they, 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 the genitalia is, is 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 a kind of the smoothed, you know, kind mm. of um, the difference between the nude and the naked sometimes. Precisely, yes. yeah. and and also the idea that that the female should be kind of hiding or modest. You think about the. Mm. Um, the Medici Venus is is a, a very famous sculpture where um, she, she's meant to have been bathing uh, in a grotto or something, and but there's a noise, and then she's got two hands, one hand over um, sort of covering her vagina, and the other hand sort of covering her breasts, mm. and that bizarrely, you know, that was considered one of the most erotic, edgy, um, edgy you know. Like blow your mind kind of um, so weird, things in the world up until you know the late nineteenth century, and even so. how they covered the David with um, gilded leaves. Yeah, because yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's right. So or, or unfortunately, they knocked the poor penises off with a you know, which is a bit not not a nice thing to think People about. People had weird convictions back then. Yeah, um, Leonardo was offered the commission of the David before Michelangelo, but he turned it down. Do you think that this formed part of the basis of their rivalry as almost a jealousy and regret from Leonardo? Yeah, I mean, I think that they – well, they were great rivals. The one that really – the rivalry that really um, got them, I think, was um, when they were both working on the um, – Battle of Cascina. Yeah, the Battle mm. of Cascina um, uh, the, the, uh, in, in, inside the Palazzo Vecchio and they were both working on the basically opposite walls. Mm. And um, – well, ironically, both you know neither artist actually finished the commission that they were that, that they were given, but um, but they were sort of in in direct emulation um, at that stage. Um, but I think that you know Leonardo ultimately uh, was too into his own sort of things to really get too bothered by Michael Michelangelo and his rivalry. Mm. I mean, Leonardo was on a whole other trajectory. That's a whole other. Story. You don't think you would have been because. I just always thought it'd be so interesting if you were. I feel like the great geniuses would have known they were the great geniuses. Do you know what I mean? It would you'd, you'd be very self aware of, you'd be very aware of how good you were if you were a Leonardo or a Michelangelo. And I just, it'd be it's so strange that in the history of art, the two greatest artists lived at the same time in the same city. And I, I just there must have been such, spoken or not, rivalry between the two. Yeah, I know, definitely. I mean, each other. definitely, and I mean, indeed, indeed, you can read the whole a lot of the history of art as a sort of a you know history of heroic rivalry. Vasari's Lives of the Artists um, is 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 very much based on the idea of rivalry, and um, he sees it as a kind of a you know um, source of creative tension to to bring artists to a stage of. Larger than life, you know, power in that they're trying to, um, they're trying to, um, yeah, as you say, you know, be, be the best in a very crowded field, and so to um, overcome, you know, their opposition. Um, Michelangelo did that very much, and he was always very aware of his own place within what it was like. 
there's there's an element of Michelangelo himself thinking about himself and thinking about how great he was essentially in everything that he does, and that's very true also about David. For instance, there's a preparatory drawing for the sculpture David, which shows his plan for what how the sculpture should be, and then there's a little uh, verse uh, written beside it by Michelangelo, and. It essentially, I mean, transliterating what what it says, it says something like, as David achieved with his sling, so I achieve with my bow. What he means is the bow that you use chisel with. To, yeah, mm. to chisel with. So he's saying that that as David, you know, had this God given gift um, to enable him to, you know become a hero. <laughs> he felt he had divine power. I have way. divine power mm. too. I'm Michelangelo and I have divine power too and I'm sort of channeling this power as, as, I'm, as I make the, the David. And yes. it's, hard, it's hard not to believe him as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean again, it's 5.17 metres. It's an amazing at, thing. I mean, at 26 can, as well. Who can do that? I mean, it's extraordinary. Yeah. Someone at my age creating the greatest freestanding Yeah, well, well. <laughs> you, don't worry, Pretty, you've still got time. You've still got the time. A uh, half, couple of months. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't think we'll ever have someone who was the greatest painter, sculptor, architect, engineer and poet ever again. Yeah, yeah. He clocked the game. He was pretty amazing and yet apparently not really very happy. So that's interesting. Very grumpy it? guy. Yeah. Do so think, maybe we don't want. Maybe it's best not to be too much of a genius. No, but <laughs> to be talked about on a podcast five hundred years true, later might be true. might be worth it. True. Do you think the contrast between well, there's the desire to know the word of God in the Renaissance, but there's also the illiteracy of most people. Do you reckon the desire to solve that issue is what spurred the initial drive towards realism that we see so well done in the horror you, you mean the, 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 the idea that, you know, art or whatever is a, is a talking book for the illiterate? Mm, and, yeah, and, yeah. and the more realistically you portray that, the better you convey the word of God. Yes. I think also, though, the whole thing about Renaissance realism is also um, a kind of a way to express new forms of devotion because... Um, there's um, more emphasis on trying to um, understand the emotional impact of the biblical stories or, for instance, to understand um, different aspects of the life of Christ, different aspects of the life of the Virgin. You know, they, they, they so much of um, 14th and 15th century art is about trying to understand, expanding the sort of vocabulary of subject matter to do with the Virgin, also Christ. Um, so, um, and and a lot of that was about trying, as I say, trying to express the emotionality of, of subjects through, like, making them like look like they were real. Um, and, you know, like, that, that you know, goes hand in hand with, like, the, the new devotional... Um, teachings of St. Francis of Assisi, for instance, um, and the Franciscans mm. who, who were huge, you know, from the 13th century onwards. So, yeah, yeah, all, all, everything that you say is true, but I think it's also to do with, um, as I say, devotion and sort of new aspects of the, you know, the Bible that they were trying to express, mm. yeah. So they needed new techniques to do that, yeah. It'd be interesting as well because the ambiguities in the Bible would leave a lot of room for creativity in the visual arts that you wouldn't have had uh, from literature. Yeah, it, that's true. It's it, it, it's true. Like, that's right. I mean, you'd be like, you know, the story of um, the, um, you know, the, the birth of Christ is – it's like it's not a very long story, <laughs> you know, but, and yet, you know, the, the artists have, have, have come up with all of these different sort of ways of showing it or alluding mm. to it or, yeah. And yeah. the David's a perfect example because he's, I think he's just described as a, a young man in the Bible, but that's such a, obviously such a broad category anywhere from, you know, 16 yeah. to 30. Yeah, yeah, So, uh. they're not They're not doing paintings from Dickens, you know, no. which is sort of a verbose, like lots of things, lots of details. They're doing... 
paintings from this like really uh, spare, you know. Also, the other thing is interesting. Crystallized, is, almost, crystal, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Also, the other thing that's interesting is they're doing paintings from, well, particularly obviously when you get to the Gospels of 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 counter narratives where they all they sort of say different things about 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 the stories, mm. which is which gives them more room to move with in in mm. a way. Anyway. You're also a musician and lead singer of, uh, well, your current band, the Christopher Marshall Predestination. What came first for you, your love of art or your love of music? Um, that's interesting. Uh, maybe art. I mean, I think, I think. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, I, I've always loved art. But, but I don't. But I, but I, I don't think I. I mean, this is. I'm not a. I mean, the reason why I'm not a visual artist, although I I spend my life studying visual art. Um, is that I started off being just interested in beautiful things in museums. Um, one of the first things I remember loving was when we went to the British Museum when I was, you know, probably four. And I do remember this. Um, in fact, I forgot the name of the person. Anyway, it's this poor guy who got thrown into a bog, um, like uh, during the Anglo-Saxon period, and then they discovered him in the bog, you know, in the 20th century um, and he's, he's all squashed and flattened like a piece of old leather and they, they took him out of the bog and um, he's called the Playstow Man or something. I'll have Play, to get the reference. Play-Stone it's something Man. I saw. Bog. Uh, bog, say Bog Man in the British Museum and you'll find him. He's just amazing and he's in this kind of glass cabinet. Oh, and, wow. That's a real person. Yeah, yeah. He's just big because Pete, you know, Pete preserves uh, things forever. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, look, look yeah. Look at that face, though. Yeah, wow. yeah. Because he's all squashed. He's been. He's but he been, almost looks so peaceful. He's been ritually murdered, you know. Oh. Um, and um, so I, I, I kind of, I was, I was really drawn to just the amazing things that you can see in museums. Um, and then as part of that, I really got into art. Um, and then, I don't know, music? Well, music is something that happened when I was in my teenage years. Mm. It was a little bit later. Uh, when I saw Iggy Pop on Countdown in 1979, which is obviously a little bit um, quite a long time ago, but uh, he, he, he came on Countdown and he just totally destroyed <laughs> the, uh, the whole set and... Um, I remember, and I, I mean, I was a school kid and I remember going to school the next day and everyone going, oh, did you see Count? Did you see that, that really, that guy? He was, he was mental. He was popular. He was mental. I remember thinking, wow, well, if that's mental. That's, I'm mental. That, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the gang that I'm going to be in. I was listening to your album, uh, the one from the late 90s, um, Strange Waters, yep, yep, Small Mercies. Yep. And there's almost... It's uh, grainy is the wrong word, but you sort of like emphasize the analog sound a lot in that. Sure, sure, yeah, and, there's a lot um, of that there. Yeah, I love that kind of audio quality though. It just makes it so much warmer and real. I, I even asked when I uh, was getting my mate to produce the music for this podcast, I asked if he could put that vinyl white noise definitely in the background. It yeah, makes yeah, it so yeah. cozy. But, well, we just recorded. We've done the back the um, the basic recording for a new album up at Woodend. Uh, couple of weeks ago and that was all live and um, it, it's definitely going to sound grainy. <laughs> how, many, how many takes does it take to... Well, we, we, uh, well I, look, we've been, I mean, actually we, we were delayed a year because of COVID, which was annoying at one level, but it was good at another, le- another level because it meant that we've actually been doing the songs for a while now. So we did the songs all of... So we recorded 11 songs in one day. And um, we, you know, sometimes, you know, we did, we did two takes sometimes. Um, sometimes we just did one take and we... Is that, is that normal though? Uh, probably not for kids nowadays. I imagine people it was would very take jazz. hundreds of takes just because you'd be so... Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's what, that's what, that's what, that's what mainstream big people do. Mm. But, but, but then well, you I, lose that live quality. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I mm. look, I, I, look, it's, mm. it's like... The live performance is really my thing, you know, getting lost in the performance and, and getting the performance to take you to the place that you, that you hadn't quite thought of before. In fact, that's really what predest- what's one, of the, one of the things that predestination alludes to. It's, 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 it's a, the destination that you thought you might get to 
before you actually have the journey, but you've got to go on the journey to get there and right. it just happens on the way. Did it take a long time to come up with a name? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I collect names, I collect song titles, I collect weird stories in, in, in that I read in the newspaper and in the media. You know, like a lot of things could be you. Oh, well, you're, you're an I, artist, you know. Well, I used to... Um, a mate of mine and I, we had this thing where you could find if you isolated two any two words from Shakespeare, you'd get an unreal band name. Like Absolutely. For, I think there's yeah. the Inky Cloaks, there's the Brief Candles. There you go. They're just all, all over the shop. There you go. Um, what generally comes first for a musician, the lyrics or the music? Well, look, for me, I mean, for, for, for a musician, quote, unquote, the music comes first. But but I, I don't really pretend to be a musician. I'm a singer. I'm a singer in the sense that, you know, um, the old, you know, the old school style, and I, 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 I don't put myself in any way on a level of him. But you know, Elvis Presley is the ultimate singer. Mm. Uh, um, um, uh, I, 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 so, and that, you know, that that gives me certain. Uh, well, it's what I am. I, I just have to work with it. It gives me certain things that, that advantages. It gives me certain disadvantages. It means musically. Um, you know, I uh, I need really good people to work with, and you know that that you know I'm I'm not as adroit musically as um, someone who's you know studied at the con or whatever. Um, but on the other hand, uh, what what I what I do have is is I have a very strong emphasis on performance, and yeah, the performativity, the the zone that you could get into, you know, with a really, really great performance. Mm. Um, and that's that's what – I mean, another thing I'm really into is um, Kowali singing, Q-A-W-W-A-L-I. It's like a Sufi singing thing. It's, I don't know what it's Sufi like is either. Sufism is a it's, – it's an Islamic um, – it's an Islamic kind of um, philosophical slash religious – Kind of movement, and um, it, it, it's it's not a mainstream movement within um, Islam at all. It's a, it's it's um, it's a very kind of uh, weird sect in a way. But 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 Sufism um, has some amazing poetry and an incredible music tradition. And um, the pe- some of those singers, whoa, they are to die for. There's a guy just called. Vocally, more quite interesting. They're amazing. Yeah. They just go. They're, 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 it's all about. What, why am I saying all this? Because it's all about the performance, right. right? And they've got this kind of thing where they, it's almost a ritualistic thing because it's partly religious. Well, it is called a religious music. The opposite of what we do with music, essentially. Yeah, and they all get together and they and and they he, the the singers when they're really good. They just go off in these flights that are just like unbelievable. There's a guy called Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. What a singer! I'll, I'll send you a link. Nusrat uh, Fatih Khan. What? So they almost go into like trance. Yeah, exactly. It's like trans transcendental music. Definitely oh, yeah. is, a, is a good way of putting it. And and they're kind of stuck in the zone. And they've got this very sort of repetitive kind of um, playing that goes. But it's sort of it's behind them, and and it's just beautiful stuff. What's your What's your approach to writing lyrics? Uh, well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, lyrics are really, really, really important. Um, what's the process? You you sit down and. What I do, is, well, normally, like I say, I, I collect little things which become ideas for songs. And then, I mean, you do it different ways. Sometimes you have an idea that you then sort of write down the lyrics and you take it to someone and then you work on it. Sometimes mm-hmm. we, we, we just were in a room together, this um, very talented um, 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 guitarist called Baz Turnbull that I'm working with at the moment, um, and we'll just bounce around ideas and then, and then something might, like a rhythm that he's playing will suit um, a particular... Um, a particular, um, you know, lyrical bit that I have in mind and then I'll construct something out of that. But the, 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 the final thing I'd say is that I, I, it, it, I it's almost like a form of um, it's not method acting. I, I've got to feel not, not even the story but the mood. It's like I want, I want there to be a mood that is conveyed musically and lyrically and through the you know the, the 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 actual timbre of my voice, um, where each element 
can be replaced by the other, if you know what I mean. So the lyrics are really important, but in a way it's the way I sing the lyrics that is just as important as the lyrics themselves, if you know what I mean. It almost sounds like the musical equivalent of abstract expressionism. Yeah, 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 definitely. In that sense, in yeah. that, that I'm going, yeah, it's that I'm going, I'm going for a kind of a um, a way in which everything works together to create a mood that um, go, goes beyond the actual words. It's mm. hard to explain, but 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 it's very hard to talk about your own. It's, it's, it, mm, I that, it. it's uh, that's so true. You must find that all the time. Yeah. You can be very. I avoid we can, it we a can lot. talk all day about Velasquez, yeah. but when you talk about yourself, it's a lot harder. Who are some of your favourite musicians? Iggy Pop, obviously. I, yeah. Uh, well, I mean. I mean, my, 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 the band that I was in before, um, the stuff I'm doing now, Harem Scare, we we were we were like, we were called blues punk, I guess, and um, we were very inspired by uh, blues artists like Howling Wolf, um, Muddy Waters, John Lee Hooker, John Lee Hooker, who was a Detroit-based blues guy, just uh, one of the giants of. Um, Blues music. He's a very similar in some ways to what I just was talking about with Kowali Sufi music, in that he he just um, gets into a groove, you know, and the groove is is kind of like means to an end. Big, big, yeah, it's mm. it's like he can take it anywhere, you know, mm. and um, it's almost like the repetitiveness of the groove that then gives him a framework to be incredibly fluid and sort of, um, 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 you know, inventive and, in and interesting. Um, they were very inspirational to me, you know, when I was starting out, the the blues. Um, but, but again, you know, I listen to all kinds of things. I mean... Um, um, jazz, the you know the idea of like we we're just talking about you know Blue Note Records, you know all those great John Coltrane. Um, I find it so funny with jazz in the same way that we were talking about how horrified people were by uh, the fallacies and, <laughs> yeah. um, in in the Renaissance. Um, it's so funny to think that jazz was seen as such a rebellious form of music in the early twentieth century. Well, that, look. If I if I switch that to, to to rock music, it is interesting because you know when I started playing, the stuff I was playing was kind of you know pretty pretty out there and pretty you know in some ways it was a bit confronting and you know I remember, remember I I you know confrontational in my gigs and things like that, but now it's like you know the Velvet Underground, you know the Sex Pistols. You know, all those reference points uh, for me when, when, when I was young, which was pretty radical out there music, it's become heritage music, you know. And that's a weird thought. That is weird. That, you know, it's 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 almost like I really hate the word Americana when, they, you know, heritage music and people go, doing de doing de doing and they play, you know. You know, I think, well, why bother? But it's almost like, you know, playing stuff that's a bit inspired by Lou Reed or something is is just a new form of heritage music now anyway. Yeah. It makes you think of what's going to be considered that in 50 yeah, years. Yeah, well, my, you know, my son, who's even younger than you, he goes, oh, Dad, you know, you know <laughs> guitars, you know. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's yeah, weird. Of... It's a bit challenging, but, but it's even, good. Even he like goes, guitars, years... man, you know, people don't need guitars anymore, Dad. They just need beats and they need, you know, all right, all right, all but right. But even 10 whatever. years ago I would have said classic rock was still the most dominant genre ever, whereas now it's almost definitely rap. It's, yeah, I'm it's the most dominant genre. <laughs> yeah, you're telling me. I've always thought the... The cool thing about rap, though, is that it's almost a prerequisite that you have to come from a hard life to be accepted within that community. It's a genre tailor-made for people who have, you know, been dealt uh, a bad hand uh, in life. Rap's terrific. Yeah. But, um, everything, I mean, and everything grows out of other things, you know, like like um, in rap, so much of rap comes from... Um, DJ and music in reggae, which I totally, totally love. Um, so, again, when I was young, I was very dismissive of lots of music. Um, you know, we, we played our music and I, oh, I, didn't, I didn't like this, I didn't like that. The older you get, one thing I will say is the more um, accepting you get of other things and the more you can kind of realise that sort of everything's interesting in its own way if you, if, if you just really kind of tune yeah. your ears into it. You mentioned Muddy Waters was one of your inspirations. Have you heard that story about when Mick Jagger and 
Keith Richards first met Muddy Waters in the hallway at Columbia Records? He, what? He was switching lights or something, yeah. doing something pretty prosaic. Well, that always yeah. that always worshipped him uh, from across yeah, the pond. Yeah, 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 and then yeah. when they came over, they just saw this guy, I think, yeah, fixing a light bulb or painting the wall or something yeah. and, yeah, doing lowly work for the esteem with which they held him. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it was such a... Definitely. Uh, but also uh, if you extend that, the interesting thing is also that, you know, I mean... Um, at that stage, you know, blues music wasn't particularly um, well regarded in in, in, in America, um, but it actually took the British, you know, that's a weird thing about the British invasion. It took uh, the Rolling Stones and uh, them and, you know, the Yardbirds and, and, other, and, other, and other bands who were into the blues to turn the Americans onto their own onto their culture own and then mm. they all got totally into it as well and you got... Um, you know, wonderful uh, garage punk uh, movement of the mid '60s, um, where they're all trying to sort of sound like Chess Records. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was like the English that taught the Americans how to how to. How good they them. were. Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps to finish up, Chris, I'll just throw up a throw out a pretty broad question: Why is art important, and why should people care about it? Well, you know, because it changes your life. Because it's 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 you know, it 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 it, it gets you to think outside of yourself. Um, it gets you to think beyond yourself. Um, it gets you to see maybe what you could be. It makes you think about other worlds, other realities, other possibilities, um, and. It, it never ends. Beautiful. Well, thanks for coming on, Chris. Thank and, you. Uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Very interesting. Bye.